Ladies and gentlemen, our next panel, as I was saying, will discuss what are the headwinds and tailwinds for financials, IT, pharma, manufacturing, and specialty chemicals in the current financial year. And the panelists for this interesting discussion are, let me welcome them and introduce them to you. Mr. Kunal Pavaskar. Mr. Kunal Pavaskar joined Tata Asset Management in September of 2021 as Principal Officer and Head Portfolio Management Services. He brings with him an astute insight into businesses and understanding management. He also keenly studies business and market cycles and is focused on using this knowledge productively in the investment process. Mr. Kunal Pavaskar is a postgraduate in management studies from IIM Indore. Over the past decade and a half, he has worked with leading organizations, including InGrowth Capital Advisors, Avista Advisory, IIFL and SBI Capital Markets. He has worked across investment management and investment banking, private and public markets respectively. And in the past, he had set up Capital Orbit to educate investors on long-term investing and markets. We extend a warm welcome to Mr. Kunal Pavaskar. We have with us Mr. Madan Gopal Ramu, the fund manager for PMS and alternative investment funds category three with around 14 years of experience in the Indian financial markets. He currently manages an AUM of Rs 1,835 crores and has over four years of experience in managing funds. He joined Sundaram Mutual Fund in 2010 as a research analyst from Centrum Roking and has made rapid progress during his tenure in Sundaram AMC. He became head of research in April 2015 and started actively managing funds from January of 2016. Mr. Madan Gopal Ramu comes with strong academic qualifications and he's a qualified cost accountant and has a management degree from BIM Trichy. A very warm welcome to Mr. Madan Gopal Ramu. We have with us Mr. Manoj Baheti, who comes armed with over 20 years of a rich, diverse financial services experience, having worked with marquee institutions, including Edelweiss Securities, Morgan Stanley, RIL, HPCL. He last spent 11 years at Edelweiss Securities. He is known for his differentiated, non-consensus research and pioneered forensic research popularly known as Analysis Beyond Consensus, ABC Research. Mr. Manoj Baheti has represented several committees of the CFA Institute, including Chairperson of India Advocacy Committee and is a member of the US-based Global CDPC Committee. He's a fitness freak as well and has been running marathons since the last eight years. A very warm welcome to Mr. Manoj Baheti. And ladies and gentlemen, this session will be moderated by Mr. Gaurav Pruthi, who is the Vice President and Channel Head of Alternates at Axis Asset Management. He has nearly two decades of industry experience and over the years has played multiple roles under the sales function in the banking, distribution and asset management space. And he's a B.Tech from AAU Gujarat and did his PGDBM from SCDL Pune. A very warm welcome to our moderator, Mr. Gaurav Pruthi. And with that, it's now over to you, sir. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Ashwarya. And, uh, uh, you know, very good evening to everyone on this call. Uh, my name is Gaurav Pruthi and I'll be your moderator for this session uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, you know, wherein we are going to discuss, uh, you know, a very, uh, a very interesting topic, which says that what are the headwinds and tailwinds for financials, IT, pharma, manufacturing and specialty chemicals in the current financial year. Uh, I work with Access Asset Management, wherein I head the sales function for the alternatives vertical. Uh, by alternatives, I mean uh, portfolio management services and alternative investment funds. Uh, though alternative investments from a regulatory standpoint uh, is not more than a decade uh, old in India. However, I see us at an inflection point uh, with lots of money and talent serving investor needs with very niche strategies being offered in today's times. Uh, all our esteemed panel members today are responsible towards investment management of the alternative business in their respective firms. Uh, on the discussion agenda, I'm of course going to ask questions to the panel members and uh, however, if anyone in the audience has any questions, then please post it on the chat box and we'll try to cover them as well. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, let me just call out uh, our esteemed panel once again. Uh, very well, welcome to uh, Mr. Kunal Pavaskar from uh, Tata AMC, Mr. Madan Gopal Ramu from Sundram Alternates and Mr. Uh, Manoj Baheti from Carnelian. Uh, so I'll I'll pre, uh, start with you, uh, Kunal, uh, since since you were introduced first. 
uh, 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 you know, this this entire uh, confluence by PMS AIA world is on a broader theme of summer of 2022. Uh, equity is in the air. And Kunal, interestingly, one of your area of interests includes a uh, factor-based approach of investing. And I know this is more of an outlier considering what we are going to discuss here, yeah. but can you throw some light for the audience, uh, you know, a little bit on factor-based investing, and then obviously we'll dive into, uh, you know, the other uh, headwind, tailwind re with relation to other uh, sectors that we're going to cover, but a little, little bit where you can just give us some color on factor-based investing. Uh, yeah, I'll try and maybe uh, to an extent if we could connect it to the discussion at hand. Uh, so for uh, uh, the benefit of uh, everyone who's watching this, uh, factor-based, I mean, we are used to the traditional way was always the fundamental way where you look at balance sheets, profit loss and cash flow statements of a company, look at their way they run their business, product, uh, span of products, what they're doing and outlook and all of that, model cash flows and come to a certain value and see how price compares against that value. Um, then uh, the moment you go towards uh, factors, now this all this started from the academic side initially where people started to see what is it that in, in simple words, it would be what makes a stock tick. So what are the reasons that make a stock tick? And if you were to distill the uh, reasons down into things that you could measure, and then say, for example, um, if um, if value is determined as, as a factor that we want to test, so you need to first be able to define value. And if we define value as, say, price to book of a company, which is you can do it for any, all, I mean, any company out there. And suppose as of yesterday, we take the stocks in the Nifty 500 and we look at their P by V values, sort them all. And we could decide, look, the first 10% of the top decile on low value, uh, you know, let's treat it a certain way and let's make a basket out of that and, that and see how it runs. Uh, and say at periodic, uh, uh, you know, intervals, you rebalance this and again, pick the cheapest stocks on this metric. Uh, there's nothing to say that this is the best metric or there's something else that is better out there. It's, it, it all depends on what kind of uh, approach you're looking at. So some people will... Um, you know, do it with a static uh, factor or a basket of factors. And some people may take a multi-factor approach where they'll say that depending on certain other parameters or even discretion judgment, I will choose a, a factor at a certain point of time or say two or three factors to make a, a, a bring together a bunch of stocks in the portfolio. And um, the this this is very different from the way we traditionally look at it. Uh, in fact, one of the factors that you could work with, for example, is momentum. And momentum has nothing to do with, uh, you know, the fundamentals of a company. It is purely to do with the price uh, price series that the a certain stock has, and how all the stocks in that universe have, uh, you know, have moved up or down. And you are just measuring things on how they how they have moved. Now, um, uh, again, this is just a way to uh, look at things, um, especially in the last two years. What we have seen, the way we have seen certain sectors come to the fore. Now, when we look at it from a uh, fundamental lens, now we know, for example, things that have been in a slumber for a long time. So metals woke up in around September 20. Um, some of the PSU banks, etc., woke up around then. Things that are doing yeah. well for the last few years before that, uh, then took a backseat. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, when we look at it from the factor factor view, you can actually uh, you know, even see that there were factor rotations, the way most of us who are steeped in the world of fundamental investing, we, we spoke about it like, uh, like there are sector rotations happening. Uh, yes, but yes. I can also tell you that at the same time, there were sector rotations, the factor rotations happening. And uh, it's, it's just a way for us. Now, some people may choose to use it like an overlay and there are pure funds, uh, quant based funds, which may use it wholly. Right. Uh, in a nutshell, that, uh, that would be, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the way when you look at value and growth as factors, which is something that I think in the last couple of years, people have started appreciating more uh, because of the violent rotations that happened. And uh, when one was forced to look at certain sectors or classes of stocks, which until now hadn't moved. No? So, you know, yeah. are you missing out on something? Um, I'll also say that it needs different analysis in India. Certain things that may be value and growth outside may not exactly tick the boxes here from the same value and growth. Uh, but yes. it's a very interesting area and 
you know there are ways in which you could uh, creatively incorporate it either into your process as an addition to what you already do or there are ways in one uh, in which one could completely do it stand alone no no that's that's absolutely correct uh, kunal in fact what we what i understand is that the quality of data is very important when you're doing a factor based fund yeah especially if it's a multi factor based fund so uh, i'm sure with your capability uh, i'm sure tata would uh, soon think of doing something on that front also uh, but i'll 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 come back on this and i i'm sorry i want to go to uh, you know manoj and uh, 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 you know uh, manoj uh, uh, a warm warm welcome to you as well uh, uh manoj do you still clock uh, less than 2 hours in a half marathon or or the timing has improved no it is still less than 2 hours so last okay. one i did in 1 hour 51 minutes which was satara i guess no it was uh, uh, mumbai mumbai satara okay. generally takes little longer being a hill run okay. so that i did yes. in, i think in 2 hours 3 minutes <laughs> okay no that's great manoj uh, manoj you are a believer in uh, value investing is what i read yeah. from your profile and and hence this question is quite apt for someone like you you know are we seeing some sanity coming back to equity markets given some of the corrections that have happened or there's uh, more froth left yet to get evaporated what do you think i think uh, if i see market right now this of this november and december i think there are two things in november and december uh, the perception of risk was less but actual risk was on a higher side very high right yeah. now the way i see it the perception of risk is on a higher side but actual risk has come down a lot because if i see all the fundamentals as well as the structural drivers like uh, you have touched upon almost three four sectors uh, in this session which will cover almost 75 to 80% of the market cap of uh, of the country yes. so if i look for each of the sector whether it is banking uh, bfsi entire means banking credit as well as non credit uh, manufacturing space which will cover entire gamut of sectors as well as uh, it though we may not be covering but that is another space so if i look at each of the uh, segments the structural tailwinds which were there in november december those structural tailwinds still continues though there are like some uh, uh, some temporary i would say disruptors in you may call it inflation you may call it higher commodity prices higher crude oil prices all those things yeah. which may yeah. lead to some kind of margin pressure over medium to short term but when yeah. i talk about like china plus one strategy the kind of pli incentives never before we have seen like this kind of health of balance sheet where like uh, banks are having like with capital adequacy ratio of 15% 72% pcr all those things so all those things if i put together i think the structural growth momentum is intact maybe yeah. like one or two quarter we may see a uh, margin headwinds but uh, means uh, and the most important thing is that valuations are much more benign this of is november and december so i yeah. think uh, i would say that i would see that the current market in terms of valuation as well as the structural drivers much more attractive and interesting for a long term investors who are having a time horizon of let's say 2 to 3 years time right right no no i think you touched upon the heart of the topic because uh, china plus one pli all the innovation that we are seeing and i will bring in some questions around that for all three of you but uh, thanks so much manoj that gives a perspective that you know the structural story is very intact in india and uh, obviously you know there are there are headwinds which will kind of create some short term disruption so that's the message that we take from you as of now sure. uh uh just just going to madan welcome to the panel discussion madan uh, and uh, as i understand you've been a hardcore equity research person with with very bottom up fundamentals at its core and uh, today's world is you know full of info- information that boomerangs from everywhere uh, just a very casual question to you madan but what do you advise your team with respect to uh, some of the new ideas that they may be bringing to you at this stage and there are a lot of these new companies new sub sectors emerging every now and then right i mean and the listed world operates slightly differently at least i'm seeing that 
from an unlisted uh, lens but what do you advise your team thanks uh, thanks for having me in this panel so see uh, uh, alternates uh, on the alternate side the um, the way we uh, try to structure the portfolio is is not about looking at where we can make the next 20% return right so uh, it's it's all about looking at creating a large alpha over a longer period of time um so uh, the the framework with which we always have been selecting stocks uh, is to look at if uh, nifty's earnings growth is going to be 10% can you find out companies where the earnings growth can be double the nifty's earnings growth um and uh, not just for one year two year but little long period in terms of uh, so the kind of businesses and the businesses where there is a long term growth potential with long with much more longevity and then visibility uh, which also takes on the quality of uh, uh, the management as well as uh, the quality of the business in the form of uh, say financials like uh, what is the profitability of the business model itself and once you can get any stock it may be in any sector but which can tick into these parameters then i think you have fairly done your homework sometimes the opportunity is higher depending because of the uh, uh, momentum in the economic growth sometimes the opportunities might be much lesser so from that reason we have been very sticky to two three uh, sectors where we have done a lot of uh, work in terms of searching ideas within that and then uh, uh, doing it because not many companies would uh, uh, say pass this filter of generating a 20% earnings growth on a very long term basis right um, so in this uh, last year uh, probably was a year where everything flew but next year next two years i think it's going to be a very uh, concentrated sort of uh, market performers um, you might have sectors which may not do well but within sectors you might have the good winners um, and even within uh, there could be some sectors which are generally moving up also uh, uh, so you have to be very very selective in the next two years so the idea is to what i what we do uh, as part of the research is uh, to, uh, to keep on filtering and then prepare that list whenever valuations are attractive i think uh, we can we can get into those stocks uh, not be in a hurry because i think next uh, uh, six months uh, market will have their own volatility um, there could be sector rotations or not you will get your chance is what i feel um, but but search for these kind of ideas where you make a meaningful uh, return not just the next 20% because the market has become like that there is yeah. a shift happening from sector to sector depending upon news flows now this is not ideally the good market for uh, for for long term uh, stock picking uh, but when your sector is correcting then i think that's a, that volatility should be your opportunity not not a risk so buy them at that point of time hold them for 3 4 years then you have a real chance of making money um so that is the framework with which we are we are working on true no that's absolutely apt uh, madan i think last couple of years we've seen everything uh, kind of moving we saw a, a long run of value underperforming and then we suddenly saw value stocks turning we saw mid and small caps kind of coming back into flavor and today everything is getting hammered so uh, unlike the previous times where we used to see that whatever has gone up very quickly will take the initial correction unless that it is a very high quality stock like maybe an hdfc or an asian paints but usually i mean that's that has been the trend and this is kind of a big big disruption that we are seeing uh, maybe because of easy money kind of getting reversed and a lot of hyper inflation across the globe so but but we'll discuss that but thanks for that madan uh, madan continuing with you and coming back to the topic you know uh, before we hear very specific views about these headwinds tailwinds uh, around these five sectors what comes to your mind uh, uh, you know in, when you hear these five sectors financials it pharma manufacturing and specialty chemicals and 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 manoj did touch upon this that uh, this nearly covers 70 75% of the market cap right but uh, is there a story in these five sure. put together and and it's not actually five these are like eight nine large yeah, yeah. sectors yes see uh, uh, again uh, the first point that i made uh, it, it's 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 uh, say the last four years has not been a great period for banking right it's not a sector which has done really well but within banking there are stocks which have done really well so uh, the entire approach for us is to identify those winners within sectors 
So uh, to that extent, uh, we were able to identify uh, retail-oriented, uh, granular book-oriented retail financing companies with very good profitability who can stay through these kind of volatile economic conditions without getting hurt more on the uh, on the capital adequacy side. Because for for banking, the what return you make on the asset and what leverage you make is the capital for next year growth, right? So even for one year, if you are if you are running a business with uh, a very low profitability, say for example, PSV banks, zero point five percent profitability, uh, and you face a downward spiral in economy, and then credit cost increases by even a point five percent. you are going to run away with capital right and you are going to stop yeah. your growth and such kind of uh, things can really reduce the long term pro- uh, wealth generation process so we are consciously we avoid those things so what i am trying to say is within sectors it is very important that you kind of get in and stay uh, particularly in this kind of market where a lot of valuation correction is also happening uh, go back to basics just identify good profitable businesses good balance sheet very good return profile compared to the peers and uh, invest into them with a view for next 2 3 years and then say uh, i think uh, fairly you will get a real good chance to make money i think of the sectors that you mentioned banking obviously but not all the banks very very specific because banking is a 90 stock universe in our uh, if i if i see there so yes. we, we are not even our universe will not even cross 10 stocks so uh, that that is all, that is of filtering we do and then uh, specialty chemical uh, i think lot of uh, uh, pos- positive news flows are coming through um, because the kind of uh, projects that uh, some of our uh, stocks that we own are winning these days uh, are uh, multiple levels of what kind of uh, projects that they might be doing in terms of size say 2 3 right. years back so really shows that indian companies are being considered and this can only become bigger Uh, uh, because europe is going to go through a, a very very uh, tough time in terms of uh, handling the inflation uh, particularly germany and all so a lot of specialty chemical companies are there in germany right so so you you will see a good amount of participation from indian companies uh, going forward um, uh, so uh, these are sectors but pharma as such when i look at have been a, not a major uh, a uh, major interest for me for a very long period obviously because the framework which i said uh, we need right. companies which can deliver a 20% growth uh, i hardly have seen any pharma companies delivering that kind of a growth from a long term perspective for a short period during covid some of them delivered those numbers but otherwise from a long term perspective given the price erosion it's been very difficult there are one or two companies inside pharma who can do this right. so we are trying to do there so uh, uh, right. it again uh, i think it was uh, the period where things looked really attractive but uh, this war probably has taken uh, some bit of growth away which should have been yes. say, probably a mid teen sort of a growth in that sector probably europe slowdown might hurt it by 3 to 4% but again it can continue to grow but let's see how margins move from here which should which should happen but otherwise i think big money making opportunity is not there in it or pharma you, you can make the next say 20 30% in the next 2 3 years but i think uh, big money making opportunity i think in specific pockets in banking in chemicals um, uh, and some consumer facing names uh, right certain things which we look at interesting interesting in fact in fact you made a point which is now kind of digressing me from the question that i wanted to ask manoj it pharma are typical defensives right uh, and kunal i'll come to you also on this but uh, is this a different time and and the question that i had posted to uh, madan was that when you hear these five broad sectors and financials itself is large manufacturing is huge like auto auto components textiles whatever you can bring in over there uh, is there a theme that comes to your mind if you want to kind of play these five stories together in a portfolio is there a theme that you can think of yeah i would say that the uh, theme is uh, in two words it's a india story so that is uh, one Absolutely. of the things uh, but uh, means uh, to um, dwell further on this in fact uh, i would fully agree with madan uh, as he rightly mentioned that whenever you select stocks longevity of earning is the most important rather than intermediate volatility in earnings so there may be intermediate volatility in the earnings which uh, means we also would like to see as a opportunity rather than as a threat 
and coming specifically to the banking sector financial sector then i will come to the it as well as pharma sector like what kind of tailwinds and headwinds we are seeing for each of the space so for banking sector i think two things which are most important for us and where we dwell lot of our time before selecting uh, means any particular uh, stock out of 80 90 mm-hmm. stocks which are there on the credit space as well as in the non credit space first mm-hmm. and foremost is what kind of liability franchisee banks are have like mm-hmm. it takes years and years and decades to build a very solid liability franchisee and right. in fact there are many psu banks which have gone massively wrong on their asset side but they have survived only because they have unparalleled liability franchise like 10 to 12% kind of gnpa for a bank which is 10 times leverage it it would have gone but because of the liability franchise so first and foremost what kind of liability franchise second is what kind of risk management practices and which will result into like what asset quality so asset quality mm-hmm. is just the outcome of the risk management practices and there we means put lot of emphasis while selecting the banks and uh, as uh, madan has also mentioned that what kind of granularity of asset uh, 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 assets which banks is having that is just the outcome of the risk management practices so based on that uh, we select the banks in terms of tailwinds i would say that if i look at the balance sheets today of the banks which i also mentioned in my initial remarks like if you see capital adequacy ratio uh, provision coverage ratio the kind of surplus liquidity which banks are sitting and moreover now banks are equipped with a very very solid insolvency code or a bankruptcy code like what kind of npas gnps which i think banks have faced in the past all banks were making good operating profit but biggest guzzler of their operating profit was the credit cost and i believe that the kind of credit cost which indian financial system has faced in the past uh, i think it is a history now even psu banks won't have that kind of credit cost which they have faced in the past so that is like just to corroborate with the numbers in 2020 the entire banking sector profitability was just 4 billion usd entire banking sector which in 2025 will go up to as i as 32 billion and main contributor of this profitability is on account of the lower credit cost so this is one thing which in terms of some of the headwinds i would say that with rising interest rates banks may face some profits some pressure on their treasury pool profit so that is i think one of the headwind means whatever uh, slr government securities which they are having if it is a non stm kind of security and secondly i think banks also have to build up the operating cost mainly to be much more digitally enabled like means uh, means there is a huge cost if there is any uh, lapse on account of your technology digital which we have recently seen with one of yes. the large private sector bank so i think there we will see in terms of uh, uh, increase in interest rate i think in the medium term it will be positive for the banks because your asset gets repriced earlier than liability like the way banks have increased uh, the uh, uh, rates on their uh, variable loans it has already happened uh, deposit are still like lagging so to that extent i would say that uh, i would uh, put uh, uh, rising interest rates positive in medium term for the banks especially for names so these are an uh, a few of the headwind and tailwinds for banks uh, coming to other uh, sorry side- uh- before before you move to before you move out of this 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 entire uh, uh, address that we done banking see uh, 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 manoj uh, uh, isn't steady you know we we saw banking in a, in a lot of turmoil because of the nps right and there was a brief period of relief in the sector that we saw uh we started witnessing some steady interest margins and overall asset quality was kind of getting there right but uh, uh you know if there is a sharp interest rate up move Mm-hmm. then isn't this one of the biggest headwind uh, to the improve improving credit growth story that was there no i don't think so because a most of the 
uh, sets which the banks are uh, having right now if you see uh, in terms of the credit rating profile of those uh, rates earlier means triple b minus used to be a significant portion so that has seen a significant improvement So, right. secondly like the kind of collateral which the banks are having that is number 2 and the third point which i think madan has also briefly mentioned that the kind of granular asset portfolio which now banks are having like even the corporate heavy banks now their biggest portion is the retail which is much more granular uh, granular and diversified this are this past and last point is that today we have like very very strong bankruptcy code which will even uh, discourage promoters to do hanky panky because we have seen under bankruptcy code how asset has gone out from the hands of the promoters even after uh, during bankruptcy proceedings those promoters wanted to get their assets back by bidding more but they could not so i think all those things right. will put uh, credit cost uh, uh, higher credit cost as a history i don't think that it will come back right right no no that that's that's obviously there you know uh, if i can get uh, kunal to talk about a little bit about uh, you know kunal uh, talking about export services uh, one of the clear maybe short term tailwind for sectors such as it pharma mm-hmm. is a, you know a depreciated currency and, and however I'm, i'm i'm sure it is never that simple uh, in your view what are what are the headwinds that will potentially hit these two sectors in particular and because a lot has been spoken about financials maybe a little bit about it but uh, maybe maybe on this your views please um sorry your voice was uh, breaking yeah, up yeah, i can hear you um, i is, uh, is, uh, is kunal i i had asked that you know about no i, I heard you yeah, your connection is fine do you want me to repeat my connection fine is my, is my connection fine yeah there there was, a, there was a little lag in between but now we can hear you all right all right uh no i got your question i mean it was about it and pharma after financials the one i've been very uh, nicely captured by manoj the one thing that i only like to add is i mean i am a fan of looking at past cycles and seeing what we can draw from that uh, the and obviously there are things that change you know after every cycle the one thing that is also in um, helps financials uh, as we move ahead from here is there is always a bit of reflection that happens after easy money policies um so when uh, growth picks up again in the economy especially after we've had a dose of easy money world over this is not only india but i mean the us fed is has led the world in easy money and now they are kind of tapering down on it also but uh, uh, you know collateral that has been provisioned and uh, even written off maybe right backs can happen so that is something that you know we we you know when when the clouds are the clouds are dark overhead uh, one one does not see too much into the future but you know in couple of years time there there is a chance of even right backs happening so that really happens even we saw that back in 2004 5 right there would be right backs and uh, the the weight surprises i think both the sell side and the buy side sometimes is that you know they are they are like um, you know um, aspan set up ke right it just it just comes uh, for old assets that were uh, mock bought etc and there are there there come buyers again for some assets maybe even so that's always good uh, for the financial sector um and then coming to it and pharma uh the depreciating uh, rupee etc i i'm not sure that's as much of a i wouldn't really call that as a great help because it's really something from the external environment and uh, you know you can well keep some some portion of your revenue hedge some money hedge etc so it helps to an extent or may not even help to an extent like is happening right now uh the dollar is trending so much against every single other currency that uh, there are cross currency tailwinds across non dollar Uh, foreign currency yes. so it kind of evens out and uh, i think if we have to back anything in any sector we should not be really uh, subject to vagaries like that um yeah. come and go uh, structurally uh, so so the I, i will i will stress less in in the investment process on the fact that we are you know having a depreciation situation right now may help etc but that's at the margin at the core is what we will we would rather look for i mean just to be very specifically answering your question So no, absolutely. That's 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 bang on. In fact, uh, that's what I mentioned. That you know, and and that this is a very. It could be a very short term tailwind, and obviously, right. you know, uh, uh, clients are pretty smart. They don't let companies actually earn through 
uh, you know currency depreciation etc so <laughs> uh, yeah 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 uh, you know we have we have we've essentially over the last half an hour spoken a lot about financials a little bit about it uh, you know manoj and madan touched a little bit about pharma yeah. uh we haven't really spoken about a lot of we hear a lot of contract manufacturing or manufacturing supported by pli right uh, mm-hmm. uh the big shift from china to india one of the biggest tailwinds that everybody keeps talking about uh, chemicals specialty chemicals electronic right. manufacturing textile uh, uh kural what's your view on this uh, uh from structurally speaking is this is this a story which is going to take some time to pan out because these are long gestation stories right mm-hmm. i mean can one immediately look at them from a immediate portfolio positioning perspective are these companies part of those um, how do i put it and some of you actually mentioned that we will not see a broad based uh, recovery right we'll see a very concentrated names actually going up even if they go up and we'll see how that happens but uh, what's what's your take on this part on the on the manufacturing part and and, and manoj and madan i would want your thoughts also on on this sure so uh, i'll go ahead on the manufacturing part first you also asked a, a bit about chemicals so i maybe to start with chemicals because that kind of predates what we are now seeing in manufacturing is my view um and i think uh, so there is there are two elements to everything there is always the domestic uh, exposure that any company has and then there is the foreign exposure uh, domestic for whatever reason will continue at its own pace and as um, ecosystem develops it will take its time but i think the real way for a country to move forward and it has been seen with all major economies so you know there was a nice report that i read around 3 or 4 years ago which documented how even the us basically rose up to exports we, we underestimate i mean today we, we you know everyone sells to the us but there was one time in world war 2 when they were exporting to the world uh the war hadn't touched them but they supplied uh, to their allied partners you know subsequently in the 60s 70s 80s we've seen the uh, you know we saw countries like korea between 62 to 78 asian tigers and obviously then the china story which really just turbocharged through from the late mid 80s late 80s to not to, to even right now uh, yeah you you a country gets richer much more much faster by you know transacting with other richer countries and not as right. much transacting within so um we have been a great uh, beneficiary for i mean in chemicals for example for something that we didn't do it's been lucky for us china really hurt us over the last 25 30 years we were put in chemicals in the 90s we got hollowed out and uh, 2016 for whatever reason they decided they don't want to pollute anymore maybe because per capita income has now gone up the richer so now you can on a fuller stomach you can now worry about other things right yes um so we we benefited nevertheless so there are companies there i remember companies i without taking names but you know people who were doing 100 crores of capex in a year and are now doing 1000 crores of capex in a year it is remarkable and it just speaks well about potential that is there here we had an ecosystem but were, you know china i think just uh, step back and we we came in and uh, right. i think from the exports point of view again in manufacturing you asked about whether there is still time i think it has already started um, yeah it is actually a sector that i think at at tata pms we are very very positive on uh, we've been writing about this in, in our communication to our investors too um, from the last 6 7 months in fact um, right today we in fact just had our letter go out and we kind of reiterated that but uh, if i were to explain just one thing so, so you you did mention pli i think that's very right so the government has taken some steps uh, but i think we what what now happens from here on again there are some unintended consequences from uh, you know whatever happened in the west what's happening in ukraine uh, power costs are whatever 5x up or 7x up these are not uh, these are not uh, regular operating environments for them to function even um, there will be business that comes out of there china for whatever reason has kept doing its lockdowns i think there is uh, so there are there are two things here and we we wrote wrote about this two months ago globalization has actually been flatlining so if we say global trade as percentage of gdp it's actually been flatlining in the last 2 3 years maybe even going down um everyone is now talking about bringing things back home right yeah. at the same time 
even though there is a so if you if you say what what is the uh, what is the overlay that even if the overlay of global trade slowing is there i think india stands in a good place because we are a neutral country we were not hostile like some certain other countries to the west right and uh, they they need trusted partners right now there are examples already of listed companies in the running calls who are mentioning how they are bringing production back from their parent in uh, europe to india uh, even in the march quarter you will find examples there are there are solid uh, things happening in fact so the, like i said manufacturing something i'm very very uh, optimistic on rather again it's been right. underinvested in for the last 10 years and uh, this the last thing that i'll just bring in on on this is i always like to you know the question question should always be what is business growth and what is stock price growth possible so business growth is something we surely look for we have to run, underwrite that but if something is especially has been unlocked for a while even better wow no no that's great in fact i i have come across some of those reports which you're mentioning and and specifically the reason we wanted to first let you answer this was primarily because we know that uh, tata has been uh, focusing on the sector um uh, madan uh, uh, what's your view considering uh, uh, you know maybe and if you can give us a little color on the policy environment as well is this uh, something which uh, you positive upon uh what's your view on this uh see um uh, see uh, some of uh, the points that was mentioned by konal uh, very valid uh, see last 10 years or 15 years china by adding a huge amount of capacity in manufacturing side has literally left nothing on table for any manufacturing uh, 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 globally also indian companies also never made big money in any of the commodity manufacturing or any of the even a uh, value added manufacturing uh, right. but now china is taking a back seat and re looking at uh, where they want to focus on is creating opportunity uh, also on top of it what is happening is uh, the uh, trade war plus some specific sectors where china is itself uh for for uh, uh because of the kind of technology those uh, manufacturing uh, sectors have been using are so bad dated uh, for cost competitiveness they have been using this for a very long period of time but now they are sure that globally everybody is uh, careful about uh, such polluting industries using uh, outdated technologies they are re looking at it there when wherever there is a refinement and improvement is happening from a technology point of view i think india's participation is definitely increasing and therefore the difference and advantage which china had because of only pure low cost manufacturing is getting negated the moment you need to have some value add in the in the in a, in a particular sector that's the reason why in specialty chemical we did really well even compared to uh, china it's not just about china plus one story it is about right. india's value add that has come on top of it so in right. the emerging reality when europe is going to go through a lot of uh, pain uh, it is it's it's a it's a it's a period where if some bit of outsourcing is going to happen from europe a lot of it will be on value added side so india right. might end up playing a lot more role than what the share india was getting in the last 10 years from that perspective given that and then linking to right. india's policy framework i think this pli scheme is a great initiative but we would like to see a lot more allocation to those incentives if we want to ramp up in terms of capturing this opportunity immediately uh, but on the other side what india has to always focus and also uh, one of the reason why we missed out on the last 5 years or 6 years of uh, growth opportunity in exports is the inflation we have had a very right. not a very good story on the inflation side Uh, which i think uh, that's single most thing that i would love any government to focus on in addition to making things easier from an administrative point of view uh, to get uh, uh, set up a, a facility manufacturing facility but most importantly if they can ref, uh, keep the inflation tight and less which is possible because not many countries in the world have self sufficiency in uh, in lot of uh, the products that are met- the met- minerals or metals that are required to be very competitive on manufacturing side uh, right. india and china definitely have this advantage and uh, china is already taking efforts to become competitive so india should not right. afford to let go to some of the policy initiatives that uh, uh, what we are seeing for the last 2 3 months in trying to control the inflation 
despite the huge inflation threat that globally we are seeing, it's it's very very uh, heartening to see. And uh, going forward also, I think if the government focuses on keeping the inflation low, automatically India will become very very competitive and also play a larger role in the next decade in getting more share out of the export opportunity than what we have done in the last ten years. Right. 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 No, no. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, uh, Manoj. I'm going to. I'm going to. In the interest of time, I. Uh, I think I want to just ask. Uh, you know, a very valid question in this whole. You know, we are witnessing a structural shift uh, in the way with businesses are being conducted, and one of the large reasons uh, behind this is the way products are being consumed. Right. I mean, I'm. I'm talking about the tech being at the fulcrum of new age businesses, and almost every sector that we are talking about today. is undergoing this structural shift right banking fintech pharma with biotech and health tech it of course and even ip and innovation in the specialty chemicals industry uh, the the whole ev story on the manufacturing side right uh, your thoughts on this this investment opportunity considering that they will propel i mean, and it's just a big conjecture that they will propel the next leg of growth in india no i think uh, goro you have touch upon a very very vast topic like everywhere we talk there is a shift happening means the way uh, the consumption happens the way uh, the delivery happen technology definitely is playing a big role shift is happening from fossil fuel to ev then from electric to hydrogen so there are like kind of disruptions as well as opportunities happening in every space so right. while investing it means uh, you need to identify the sectors or the companies which are prone to disruption like companies which may be uh, delivering x y z things like companies which are too much dependent on fossil fuel uh, if they do not innovate themselves right of the companies which are there in terms of traditional way of delivery if they do not if they do not uh, uh, means uh, uh, adopt to the new technology in terms of delivering definitely they will be prone to disruption so uh, i think there is a very very interesting shift which is happening across uh, means across the sectors and uh, right. even if you look at like in terms of the way our pli has been aligned means the government has given almost 1.9 trillion of incentives but most of those incentives have gone to the new age I means it is not like somebody who is doing like fossil fuel technology they might not have got any kind of incentives but when right. it comes to like manufacturing new age uh, batteries new age on the ev side that there the incentives are gone so i think the way government has devised the pli system it is not like targeting one two or three years they are seeing like yes. 10 year hence whether india will be capable in terms of let's say delivering a hydrogen based solution in terms of delivering ev based solution i think that way our capex is happening so i will right. give full credit to the government that they are really thinking structural long term even while devising this incentives so right it may the the benefit may be little uh, means long ended but it will be structural in nature right right so uh, so you know thanks to all three of you in fact we are uh, i think we are for our panel discussion we have five more minutes and i will uh, try to summarize what i heard uh, uh, what essentially and and just to remind all the attendees that the broad topic here was that what are the headwinds and tailwinds which are going to hit these five sectors manufacturing it pharma financials uh, and specialty chemicals in the current financial year and and the and the short answer is that uh, a lot of these sectors are important sectors uh, together they cover 70 75% or even in upwards in terms of the broader market cap and obviously you can't miss out on them but the long term structural story in india continues to be intact the uh sectors may be important but there are winners and losers in each of these sectors and all three fund managers here are very clear that when we research new ideas or we look at existing companies we are typically very very focused on uh, what are the long term drivers what is the profitability what is the unit economics and and how does it fit into the portfolio or the overall theme that we are running in the fund and uh, 
uh, that's that's broadly what i could take uh, from the advice that was coming from all three fund managers and uh, uh, obviously tech being at the center stage today or uh, performance linked incentive schemes or the policy environment all of these are long term uh, stories uh, this will continue to benefit some companies will take advantage early on and 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 that's the job of the investment managers to actually identify those stories and try and uh, you know uh, uh, create winners out of that in the portfolio continue to see where we are uh, seeing uh, uh, structural shifts within the uh, you know market capitalization uh, i think i think that's the key takeaway from from uh, what i heard over the last almost an hour from all three gentlemen uh, since we have only 3 4 minutes left manoj since you were speaking last any any last comments a short two three lines uh, some advice to the investors who are there uh, on on uh, you know given the volatility that we are witnessing today in the markets and it is spooking investors it is creating a little bit of trouble and we are hearing a lot of negative news with respect to uh, you know uh, uh, the war in the in the west and obviously uh, followed by global slow, uh, global uh, growth slowing down uh, hyperinflation across and obviously these are scary things right from a macro perspective but what would be your advice in terms of uh you know uh, uh, either asset allocation or the investment uh, environment currently for investors today from a from an equity standpoint of course so my advice is one is that uh, means, uh, even if it is for the sake of repeating i would say that focus on long term focus on structural trends avoid businesses and sectors which are prone to disruption even if they are in a very very attractive valuation zone so those sectors i think one should avoid and uh, avoid leverage and uh, i would say that uh, invest patiently and whatever sectors you choose means uh, uh, pick up either number one number two players who have got established track record in terms of delivery delivery in terms of reliability as well as in terms of balance sheet strength and roe roc metrics so if all those things are in place you can i think deal with volatility very easily you can take advantage of volatility rather than get scared out of it in in fact peter lynch has uh, uh, mentioned one of the uh, quote that the best uh, uh, thing uh, the, the best way to make money out of a stock is not to get scared out of them so and yeah. that you can only do if you focus on long term and if you follow disciplined approach of investing so that's the way i would absolutely yeah. absolutely bang on bang on thanks thanks manoj madan madan your last uh, uh, comments final closing comments i think um, on the quality parameters of looking at any business which uh, which manoj has mentioned i think all are very important in addition to it i think uh, it is all about see we run a very concentrated portfolio we run a 15 stock portfolio sort of approach okay. uh, i think what we have learned over a period is it is one is the business has to meet the profitability index business has to meet the growth index business has to meet the uh, financial parameter index but importantly whether you have the right manager sitting on the top of those businesses who can continuously surprise you from identifying the growth opportunities as well as execute the growth plan in front of it it is not about taking the guidance of the uh, or guidance of what the companies gave or what they deliver in a quarter right it is all about what they can do over next 4 5 years i i think uh, there are only few or say uh, selective uh, good promoters or managers who are capable of uh, driving uh, growth over a very long period of time people who have done well say 4 5 years back or uh, correctly currently are struggling a lot on uh, ability to deliver on growth so you have to be really really yeah. careful when you are selecting growth companies uh, betting on what kind of uh, uh, managers that you are uh, you are you are doing once you do it it's kind of outsourcing your returns to those guys right once they drive the business once they create earnings growth double the size in which the nifty earnings growth is going to be it is very difficult for you not to perform it you will perform once you get that those kind of earnings growth for four five years uh, for one uh, six months or something you might may not participate but once you are growing double the earnings growth of the broader market it is very difficult for you to not perform so that's the fundamental thing and pay attention of growth and what these uh, managers are trying to do 
and whether they can execute it that's that's in top of what uh, manoj was saying it's very important absolutely thanks 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 madan kunal uh, uh, closing comments from your side also please yeah uh, one thing that so all of us well i mean including uh, us uh, you know people from the investment community and investors who you know uh, come to us i think uh, being um, equanimous across uh, cycles at all points of time and uh, that's something that i think it's important both for us as fund managers and also for the investors because uh, uh, i strongly believe that what one can do as a fund manager is also kind of dependent on the communication that we do with them and how much the investors also understand and uh, stick through the content uh, so it it requires one to be balanced across market cycles especially like you said because times like now the headlines will make you look uh, make you feel gloomy uh, yes. but, uh, but but even then i mean what what's uh, what's what's positive in this and the fact that you know gloomy headlines and low valuations also then come together uh works in your favor so so and at the same time when maybe 8 10 months ago when things were uh, heady uh, to also have been balanced and uh, not get in not get sucked into the you know like i say the flavor of it that may not yes. make you money but rather could make you lose money so i think just balance across cycles is is pretty important yeah no so i think i think what i hear is that i mean stick to your asset allocation uh, think long term don't get swayed when markets are too breezy don't get too spooked out when markets are volatile just stick to your asset allocation and your plan and continue investing and uh, you know uh, i i Uh, i i you know i i can acknowledge one thing for sure coming from this industry that you guys are in one of those toughest spots uh, considering the investment management profile and and it's a constant uh, uh, i would say uh, fight stroke struggle to continue to find ideas continue to keep your sanity alive uh, you know keep uh, reducing noise from whatever you are hearing and trying to stick to fundamentals so uh, hats off to all of you on that so uh, Uh, you know we are we are now running out of time so i think we have hit the limit uh, <laughs> so thank you everyone for uh, joining this call and listening to our speakers patiently uh, uh, i hope some of your questions that you may have had are answered today uh, with that i once again thank our esteemed panel mr kunal pavaskar from uh, tata asset management mr madan gopal ramu from sundaram alternates and mr manoj bahati from uh, carnelian for their time and their views which they graciously shared with us today and i wish all of them good health and prosperity going ahead it was a pleasure hosting you gentlemen uh, uh thanks a lot good night and stay safe uh ashwarya back to you thanks a lot thanks to everyone thanks to thanks thank you very much thank you very much uh, mr gaurav pruthi our very eminent moderator i think he is uh, uh, executed the task of bringing truly the pearls from this panel and there were there were so many insights to take away and many many meaningful conversations uh, in one panel so great to see that thank you once again mr pruthi and thank you to the eminent panelists for joining us